What I'm going to sh present you today is basically lessons learned from implementing production data pipelines uh, with dbt on Snowflake. Um, so it's not a, like a library that we wrote ourselves, it's just the way how we use dbt. Um, uh, before I get started, some uh, things about myself. So my name is Florian. Um, I'm from Germany, I'm based in Berlin. I have a very energetic little son. I just attended the talk about how to teach coding to kids. That is, uh, so he's like a center of my life. I myself am already 40 years old and the last time I was in Prague is actually 27 years ago. <laughs> so that's like, um, yeah, I got old. Um, I have a background in mathematics, uh, in database a little bit and software architecture. And uh, since three years, I work for a company called Flatiron Health. And what we do is, um, is we work in the area of real-world evidence. What it means is we take data from operational systems, from hospitals and practices to create research set, uh, re databases for research. And we focus on oncology. Um, so it's real-world oncology data. And we do this in the US, in UK, in Japan, and in Germany, that stands for European Union. And it has two implications that are somewhat relevant for the perspective of that talk. So first of all, it's not really a big data problem. We have genetic databases, but most of the data that we actually process, that's not really big data. I mean, not, not in terms of uh, today's databases. But these are very complicated data models. Before I worked for eBay, and the data I was processing was like cl clicks on a web page, right? It's a very different problem. And since we do this in different countries, and each country has different uh, data privacy regulations, and we deal with very sensitive data, so we have very segmented environments. For example, I can never access the data of you patients from the UK. Um, so, but we still want to build systems that are shareable across uh, uh, each market, each country. And the way how we approach it looks roughly like that. I mean, off you, I mean, as all of you know, a diag diagram is always wrong, but I try to at least outline what we're doing. So if we pull data from the source systems, these like all kinds of different computers standing in the basements of hospitals, sometimes cloud-based uh, APIs from all the sources. We divide the data in two categories. One we call unstructured data, and the other thing is unstructured data. The line is somewhat blurry because most information is our free text fields. This already qualifies as unstructured data. Um, and we process that um, um, through all kinds of steps. And in the end, we, we, so we harmonize the data, we normalize the data, and put it together. And then we build different data models. Because one thing I learned working for this company is that cancer is not a single disease. It's, in fact, a collection of a 1,000 diseases. And for each cancer type, we develop our own data models, which in the end is a set of tables, which we then deliver as data marts uh, to our life science partners. And then we serve them in a secure environment. It's a, in the medical sphere, you call this a, trust, a, a TRE, a trusted research environment. It's basically a set of notebooks and uh, databases where we can basically control that the people don't join the data with outside data. So basically to prohibit re-identification of the data. Okay, with that out of the way, here's the agenda. I have one Smarty Pen slide, just one, <laughs> but you can bear with me. Um, then we have a quick look at DBT to uh, repeat the concepts that are important for the talk. And then we talk about testability. Um, first with data tests, with DBT expectations, and then unit testing for SQL models and Python models. And I said I will skip the part about reusability. Um, I will mention it maybe a couple of times, and if you're interested, you can just reach out to me. That might, just might be, turned out it would be a second talk. Okay, let's get started um, with the Smarty Pen slide. So um, this is the only slide where I mentioned a large language model, so I had the feeling that I have to. Um, my point is, it's very important that you develop a system where you can test your components in isolation, and it's easy to observe, right? I think that we all agree that this is very important. My point here is if you design your system for that, you get a lot of other important properties out of the box. Like, like my mind, so I'm thinking around the lines, so if you develop a system that you can test your components in isolation and you can observe each component, 
um, then it's also evolvable. And if a system is evolvable, you can make it more secure, you can make it more fast, you can change it, right? Um, but yeah, um, I'm happy to be challenged about that. And for me, like this uh, testing and observing is somewhat related, and it's related via data tests in my mind. So it'd be, like, of course, like a unit test. You probably some of you will point out that what I will show later is not a unit test, but <laughs> like a unit test that you can test a component in isolation. And a data test um, is somewhat really um, related to metrics. What you do is you define kind of metrics in which you fail or alert um, when certain statistical properties are not met. So these are, that is the smarty pen slide. Now it will be just uh, patterns and code. Okay, let's get started with uh, DBT. So of course DBT is much more than what I'm going to show you, but I wanna basically introduce like the most important concepts that are important for, um, for testing. The first concepts, very important, are sources. So a data source in DBT is a configuration file. And one pattern that I uh, would recommend is um, that we have, uh, we have like a source folder in our models folder and per data source we have a directory. And then for each, let's say, table of that data source we have a configuration file, right? When we started we had just one configuration file that then had like 10,000 lines of code that's not really maintainable. So basically with that structure you, it's very easy to uh, identify the tables and the data sources and then the first thing you do is you define a location where dbt will read the data from. So you have a database and a schema uh, property. Um, another recommendation is use environment variables. Allow yourself to override those values. This is especially important if you want to have different deployments like a dev staging and production deployment. Um, and the second important aspect of that is that you then define uh, your tables. At least you need a table name. Ideally, you also list the columns. Um, and we will come back to that later. So that's the first important concept, how you define the data sources in a DBT uh, pipeline. The second important concept are SQL models. And the SQL models, in the end, is a SQL file that defines a select statement. Um, in fact, uh, DBT uses, uses Ginger, so it's a template uh, with those curly braces. Um, and the curly brace, with the curly braces, you reference other models, for example, sources. You can hard code them, but you should not, right? You should always use uh, references and sources to reference like the data on which the model is dependent upon. Um, so the source is a built-in macro, and you can define your own macros and reference them. This is kind of defining a function, importing that, and calling that. We will, I will talk more about macros later. And uh, those models, by convention, live in a folder which is called models. You can change that, but that's the, the convention. Okay, SQL models. Next important concept, Python models. DBT supports Python since a year, and since DBT pushes all computation to the data warehouse, that means you need a data warehouse that can run Python code, and as far as I know, the only three data warehouses that are currently on the market that do that is Snowflake, Databricks, and BigQuery, but I might be wrong. There was an adapter for local execution of Python, but this project has been abandoned. So you can only make use as of now of Python models if you have one of those data warehouses. And then the Python model is, ba uh, is basically a Python module, which defines a function called model, um, which gets passed in a dbt object, which, which you should use. It also gets passed in a database session, which you should not use. <laughs> And it should return a data frame. In this example, I'm returning a pandas data frame, but if you have large data, then you need probably a data warehouse native data frame that lays with lazy execution like a PySpark uh, data frame or a Snowpark data frame. But if your data fits into memory, you can also work with pandas. And then you can do this similar thing with, uh, as with SQL models. So you, ha you have this DPT object, and then you uh, reference a source by calling the source function. And you can also, similar with macros, you can import your own functions and call them. I will talk about this later, but the very nice thing about doing this is you don't need to define stored procedures or something like that. It's just really normal Python code with any uh, additional uh, setup. That's all about the Python models. The next concept is the lineage graph. 
the main reason why you should always use those references and sources and, your, uh, and not hard code, other hard code other tables is so that you allow dbt to build up the lineage graph. Let's, for example, look at a MART model. So the SMART model references to other models via the built-in ref macro. So it, uh, this revenue model references the customer's model and the orders model, which I showed you before. But as a reminder, the customer's model references the customer source. The orders model references the order item source and the order source. And with this information, dbt will build up uh, the lineage graph, so the DAG, the execution graph. Um, so this is a very important that dbt knows in which uh, order to uh, generate your models, but it also gives you a very nice documentation. So this screenshot comes from the built-in dbt documentation. You can just run dbt docs generate and then you get like a website. It's, and it's very helpful. First of all, you see your DAG uh, and you can zoom in, you can filter, and if you click on those nodes, you get like meta information and the meta information also contains the compiled code. So the actually a SQL that's running, which is very, very important for debugging. I mean, my code always runs, and I never have to debug my own code, but you know, sometimes you, uh, you have to. Um, that was the lineage graph. The last concept, and then we're done with the concepts, um, are materializations. So materializations are all about how dbt writes your uh, data. And uh, I would start with specifying the target database and a base schema. Um, there are different ways to do that. We do this with a profiles file. You can put a profiles file into your uh, repository, which would contain uh, the credentials. So it would not contain the credentials, but environment variables that read the credentials, of course. And then it also has a database in the schema property. And as with sources, we, I would recommend you to make this, uh, to allow you to override uh, the target database and schema by environment variables. And this allows you to do easily things to have a production pipeline. You first build up a, if you have new data, a new release candidate, let's say, then you compare the databases and then you uh, switch the, what's the latest release, for example, like this. And this is then as easy as just setting some environment variables. The next uh, part of materializations is that um, you want to configure how your models are materialized. Um, so in the main dbt configuration file, this is a dbt projects file, uh, YAML. Um, there's this model section, um, and there you can specify for each folder or subdirectory of your models folder uh, a schema, which will be a suffix of the schema that you defined in the profiles YAML. So let's say uh, the profiles YAML defines a schema main, then the staging models would be written to a schema main underscore staging. You don't have to do this, but this is, I think, a good idea to, if you have the stu folder structure in your repository, to also have a similar table structure in your data warehouse. And then you can uh, define how those models are materialized. Um, you can override this on a model level, but I think it's a good idea to use the structure of your repositories for conventions, and rather than having individual configurations per model. Um, Two things you should pay attention to. First of all, Python models can only be uh, materialized as tables, and they can only read views and tables. Um, that's the one thing. And the second thing, which if you have very complicated SQL models with a lot of macros, you won't understand uh, the Ginger template anymore. You can use a look at the compiled code to understand what's happening with the DBD uh, docs, but sometimes it's more easy to do this in the data warehouse, and then you first want to create a view, um, maybe a materialized view, and then a table out of that. That makes it much faster to fix things in the data warehouse, but as, I think it's a matter of taste. That was the materialization section, and that concludes our quick look at dbt. Um, not everyone is looking at their phone so far, so I did not lose you, so that's very good. So then let's go to the main chapter about testability in data pipelines. Um, and I will start with the data tests. Um, um, but before we go with data tests, we brush up on our concepts. These are dbt packages because, so packages, there's a packages YAML file and you can list your packages that you want, external packages that you want to install. And there's one package that everyone should use is dbt expectations. That is a port of great expectations to dbt and it defines, it removes the need from writing custom tests 
90% of the cases, I would argue. So use DBT expectations. So it's like, um, it's an awesome project. Okay, packages. So um, now about data pests. So I, I classified this as patterns because what we do is we test our source data because we obviously, obviously don't trust our data providers. And what we do mainly is integrity tests because we do not understand the data yet. So what we do is we test the shape of the data and test the data integrity. Then we build our own data marts, and then on the mart layer, we actually apply statistical tests because now we understand the data and now we can like, formulate proper expectations like genetic types should be distributed following a certain distribution and that you can test. Um, these are data tests and the logic in between we test with unit tests which I will show later. So let's start with the source tests. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, uh, before you represent the data source via a configuration file and this configuration file for each column you can add a data test property and then do a very simple test like not null which is very important because the data warehouses do not enforce that so you can <laughs> add a not null constraint to your uh, create table statement but the data warehouse will or most data warehouses will just ignore that so it's good to test that then you can test a data type um, because you don't control the source data and you can test that this uh, column is unique. You can also test referential integrity with relationships. For example, you can say that um, like the, the custom ID must reference uh, an ID in the customer's table. So, and you can of course write more complicated tests, but these are like way on the source layer, we test the data integrity. Then on the MART layer, so the, like the final tables, we test more complicated logic. And here I, I picked the revenue model, um, for example, there's a, a mount column, and what we test first of all here with, great expect, uh, with DBT expectations, the range of the allowed value. So it should be between zero and I think it's 10 million. And a little bit more complicated, you can test a little basic distribution. You can say that 95% of the uh, rows should have at least uh, an amount of 1 million. To make it more complicated, you can also apply data tests on a table level like this you have access to multiple columns. For example, we constructed a new column with array construct. It's a snowflake um, function, but similar things exist in other data warehouses where we basically merge two columns and we tested that a combination of those columns is unique. And this now is a real, like a more real data test. Um, what this does is, so it's a bit more complicated, so we first filter out all the rows that at least have an amount of uh, over 5 million. So we, now we look at those rows. And then um, I switched the condition here, but it doesn't matter. So we say if the region, we construct a new column. If the region is east, we say it's 1. Otherwise, the value is 0. And then we test that 75%, uh, um, at least 75% of the rows have a value of 0, meaning that of those rows with an amount of over 500 uh, or 5 million, 75% uh, are not from the East region. Yeah, that's, um, that's how basically a practical test for that is uh, that you, we test the distribution of people who are privately insured, right? So basically if you have a non-numerical uh, value, you can transfer it to, with uh, this if statement to, to a number and then apply distribution tests to it. That concludes the section about uh, how we uh, the data tests on a MART level, and that's all what I have about data tests. Now I switch over to testing uh, the code, basically writing unit tests. And the first part will be uh, uh, unit testing SQL models, and that's actually since a couple of months a built-in feature. When I planned the talk, I felt very smart because DBT did not support that. <laughs> So we had to write our own um, scaffolding code for that, but now DBT uh, introduced it, so it's now very simple. So we look at a, a SQL model. Um, important for unit tests are, of course, the inputs and the outputs. The inputs here are um, two uh, sources, so the order items and the orders. Another reason why you should not hardcore tables, right, because then you cannot unit test them. And the outputs are the columns that are produced, so here are four columns. And what you then can do is um, you add some configuration. We specify a new configuration file. You can add this configuration to the existing configuration file, but we split this. Uh, I will say up something about this in a second. Um, so basically, um, there's a configuration file with a unit test section. 
There's a given section, they basically uh, specify values for the inputs, uh, for the order items, for the orders, and then you basically define your um, expectation. And then DBT will run this code. Two notes on that. This requires a database connection. So people argue that's not a unit test, but I will <laughs> ignore this discussion. Um, and the second thing, I'm using here SQL to define the data. Uh, there are multiple ways you can use CSVs, JSONs, or YAML. Um, I have an exa another example later. You want to use SQL when you need control over how the data looks. And this happens, DBT, otherwise, if you specify your data with CSV, DBT will generate SQL for you, and that might not be what you want. For example, if your column names are weird, like numbers, then DBT will not uh, uh, compile correct code. In that sense, you can use SQL, and you have full control of how the data will actually look. Um, one pattern, so what we do is, so we move the test into a configuration file that lives in a different folder. The reason is we want to have all the unit tests for SQL models, Python models, and macros next to each other. So we introduce the new specs folder. Um, and in order to enable that, we need to tell DBT that it also should look for in the specs folder for model configuration. So there in, the, in our main configuration file, we just add specs to the model paths. You don't have to do that, but this is how uh, what works good for well for us. Okay, that's about SQL model unit testing. Um, now I will talk about macros, um, and macros are for us a very important concept of DBT models. First, what they what are they? So the model I showed you now, I think three times that uh, uses two custom macros. For example, the total amounts macro. So a macro, you can call it with this curly braces syntax. Um, and a macro lives, uh, is a, in the end, a SQL file that lives in the macros folder. Um, and again, it's a ginger template. You can use other macros with curly braces. For example, you can define input values and you can reference them with like the double curly braces syntax. The reason why, um, why to use macros for us is twofold. First of all, it allows you to create smaller components that you can test. Um, so we basically can divide larger models into smaller chunks of macros um, instead of creating too many models, but that's a choice you have. You can also just basically uh, create more models. Uh, but the second reason, this is the prime, primary way how we can share code between different models, which we'll talk more about in the reusable section, but it's very important for us because between different cancer types, some properties or variables are actually the same, so have the same definition, and we use macros for them um, to build up a variable library. Okay, these are macros. So, and since for us macros contain a large chunk of the logic, we really want to unit test those macros. And dbt does not directly support unit testing macros, but it's actually not hard to do that. So if you look at that macro, first of all, we again need to look at what is produced, the output, in this case, two columns, the ID column and the uh, total amount column. Um, then we need a test model. So in that case, it's just a very simple model. It just calls this macro. So we are, produce a test model. And here we need to look at the input. And that's a little bit like the hacky stuff. We need to define a fake input model. The fake input model just contains uh, the data structure because dbt needs an input model for inferring uh, the data types. So the only thing that matters here are the columns and their types. And with that in place, it's a normal unit test uh, of this test model. So we, uh, in the given section, we can define values for the, the input model. Here we do this with YAML, and then you can phrase our expectations. Okay. But this, those fake input models, um, and I didn't find a better way to do that, but um, it's a bit ugly because in the end, dbt will materialize them in your database and somehow I want to clean them up. So what we do is in our projects file, we say models are living in a macros folder. They are written to a temporary schema. So like the as views, that doesn't really matter. And then we have an on run end hook, which just drops this temporary schema. So that's like a macro that, um, and drops the schema. You don't have to do this, but it's just that we don't have a million views lying around in our data warehouse. Okay, that's about uh, the, uh, how we handle uh, or how we do macro unit testing. And that concludes the section about uh, test, unit testing SQL models.
Oh, okay, I will, uh, <laughs> I will get this done four minutes left. So, unit testing Pyth models. First, I need to introduce Pyth models to you, um, or like Python packages. So, as, this is the Pyth model I showed you before, and as I mentioned already, you can call your own functions. But the way how you can do that, so the derive, the derive function uh, comes from a custom module, which just lives in your code base. Uh, it's a derive, func uh, derive region function. And we can make this available to dbt because, again, this Python code runs in your data warehouse. So basically, you need to make your Python code available in the data warehouse. And the way how to do this, there's a config section of this Python module where you can specify where Snowflake, in that case, should read the code from in an import section. That's the first step. Um, and the second step is that you need to make your code available to your data warehouse. So for that, we use an on-run start hook, which deploys the packages. This is a macro that first creates a schema, like where you put your code if it doesn't exist, then it creates a stage. A stage in Snowflake is basically an abstraction of uh, object storage. If you're on AWS, it's free. And then you upload your code um, to this internal stage. Um, in that in place, um, you can basically, in your code base, write normal Python code and make this available to dbt in your data warehouse. And then to test, to test unit test your Python model, it's a normal Python unit test, right? So I don't have to explain you how to do that. Um, one note maybe, okay, I will skip all that. <laughs> that doesn't matter for here. Um, the last thing I wanna mention is that since we put now um, the Python unit tests in the specs package, dbt will think, hey, so and dbt will scan the specs package for uh, uh, models, so dbt will think, awesome, there's a Python model, and it will fail because it's not a Python model, but there's a dbt ignore file, and we put these packages, like the path to the Python unit has into the dbt ignore file to tell dbt that these are not Python models. Okay, I managed in time. I'm very happy about that. That concludes the section about unit testing and about testing in general. And if you remember one thing of this talk, it's the next slide. Um, I saw this quote many years ago and I love it, um, that a good developer is like a werewolf afraid of silver bullets. So what I showed you works well for us, it might not work for you. And with that, thank you so much for listening. I have two minutes to take, answer questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions? Hey, thank you. Uh, that was very helpful. I was just wondering, uh, all those tests, in case you have incremental model where you refresh the day or update the data regularly, those tests, do they run just on the batch that is being updated or on the entire data set that put results? Uh, they would run on the entire data set. Okay. Can, can you choose? Do you have any control over that? Or? Um, so so this I, I cannot answer straight. So there's a way we actually use custom materializations in some cases for different use case because we do not want to, because uh, by default, dbt does a create or replace. Um, and there it should work, but maybe we can discuss after. So I cannot give you an answer how to do that. Okay, so it's basically... Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. A uh, question about testing SQL models. When you have multiple sources, like 10 plus sources, how do you effectively test them instead of just point, writing out you know, tons of uh, CSV code? Um, so first of all, you can structure, you don't have to put everything into one configuration file. You can put CSV files in a directory and reference a directory to organize it a little better, but it doesn't free you from creating test data. So what what I typically do is I take production data, anonymize it, and that will be the test data. So that's basically my, my workflow. Um, but yeah, some, you need to get the test data somewhere from. And honestly, what I do is I trust my implementation, I run the dbt pipeline, and then copy this produce table, and that's the output. That's kind of, uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> then maybe I didn't get, so. Right, so you, it answers my question, but you know, testing production data, just copy pasting from your model output, you know, what's the purpose of this kind of test? Um, the, so the main purpose is basically to, uh, 
so first of all, during the implementation, right, I, um, we, I assert myself, so let's say, if I really uh, want to do a test driven development, then I write the test code myself, uh, like the test, uh, the expect output myself. But um, if you want to take the uh, generated output, that's basically for securing future changes of the model, right? Because I assume that at that stage, the code is correct, and then future refactorings are protected via this. That's, that's a reason, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think we are on time. Uh... Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much again and have a nice <laughs>